Hello again, you beautiful misfits, and welcome to the Microsoft segment of my Pixel Burn Blitzkrieg of E3 2016. This one's going to be a long one, by the way, so strap your ass in nice and comfortable like. Having already covered EA's, Bethesda's and Ubisoft's conferences, which you can watch by clicking these annotations if you haven't already seen them, hint hint, blatant plug, hashtag audience engagement, it's now the turn of the Microsoft conference. Another one that started later than scheduled thanks to assorted technical fuckuppery. Before jumping straight into the announcement for a new Xbox One called the Xbox One Slim, which is slimmer, obviously, despite now having an integrated power supply instead of an external one. Although, this size comparison right here is complete and total bollocks by the way, just so you know. 40% my fucking ass, more like 10% smaller at most, and that's a generous estimate. Compare and contrast that clip to this picture for a proper size comparison. Then go back to this clip and point and laugh at it. For the lie it is. As well as all that, the new Xbox One S comes with a new wireless controller with increased range, an internal hard drive of up to 2TB, depending on which model you buy obviously, and supports 4K video and Blu-ray. It does also have a teeny bit more horsepower under the bonnet, not mentioned here, although that's solely for the 4K support, so don't buy one expecting your games to run smoother on it, regardless of what some people may claim otherwise. The head of Xbox, Phil Spencer, then came on stage to confirm the price of the new Xbox One less fat and do the usual welcoming speech, while wearing an original Xbox t-shirt that, to my complete and utter amazement, he wore throughout the entire show. Are you feeling okay, Phil? It's just your lightning fast wardrobe changes are one of the main reasons I actually tune into E3. Did this tosser's t-shirt antics in the Bethesda pre-show put you off your stride? Don't let him get you down, Phil. You'll always be my favourite E3 t-shirt swapper. Single t-shirt Phil then kicked things off with some gameplay for Gears of War 4 presented by Rod Ferguson of Gears developers The Coalition. But before that was a spiel about Xbox Play Anywhere, in which buying a digital copy of a game for Xbox One also lets you play on PCs and vice versa. Windows 10 PCs of course and get used to hearing that because it's going to be popping up throughout the entire conference. Gods help you if you're playing a drinking game with it. Along with crossplay, which Gears 4 will support for its co-op multiplayer and horde modes on launch, allowing PC, Windows 10 of course, and Xbox One players to play said modes together. Isn't that nice? Anyway, after all that bibble, we finally got to see some Gears of Snore 4 footage, which looks very Gears of War in a Gears of War kind of way. Two burly angry men and a burly angry woman, armed with guns that have chainsaws on them, move from waist high wall to waist high wall, shooting assorted alien griblies. All the while spouting masterful dialogue that, frankly, moved me almost to tears with how cringeworthy it was. Use the sea beast to bring some help out on that turret! Even the game's characters think the dialogue's nonsense. Great. Out of the storm and into the swarm. Really? But then who really plays Gears titles for their story or dialogue, eh? It's all about the guns, baby. Like this bloke shooting some more locust or whatever the fuck they are, with a buzzsaw gun that I'm sure is all very thrilling for fans of the series. For people like me who don't give a shit about the plight of tumbling ham golems fighting bugs on a planet far, far away, I could take it or leave it. Oh yeah, old man Marcus Phoenix, because it wouldn't be Gears of War without his gravelly voice and scarred mug, would it? Don't forget to buy the official Gears of War 4 Xbox controller, by the way. Up next was Rukari Austin of Microsoft Studios to present Killer Instinct, which he called the most played fighting game on Xbox One, because there's such a huge selection, of course. Rukari was here specifically to give us a glimmer of false hope that we'd left the Gears of War segment behind, then cruelly reveal some new Gears of War related content for Killer Instinct in the form of General Ram, a prominent antagonist in the aforementioned series who has joined the cast of Killer Instinct 3. Woo. Exclusive to Xbox One and Windows 10 of course, so take another drink if you're playing the Microsoft E3 conference Windows 10 drinking game. After that was some stuff for Forza Horizon 3 which is about cars, presented by creative director Ralph Fulton and demonstrated by four different people playing on four different systems, well two technically. One player was on the new Xbox One S, another was on a regular Xbox One, the third player was using what they described as a high-spec 4K Windows PC in a special car chair with his favourite steering wheel. His favourite? How many steering wheels does he own? How many steering wheels does anyone need to own? 
And the last one, a cheery looking chap called Terence on a regular Windows 10 PC with a regular boring desk and a regular boring chair. All of which certainly conveys the whole cross-platform parity thing Microsoft are clearly investing quite heavily in, while reassuring regular Xbox One owners that their little box isn't quite obsolete just yet. Aside from that, it was just cars, cars, cars and more cars. Very pretty looking cars, sure, but still cars. Cars driving on roads, cars driving off roads, cars driving on beaches, cars being dropped from helicopters because of drop-in, drop-out multiplayer, and you get the idea. Experience the laid-back fun of Horizon with your friends. Yeah, laid-back. A phrase you'd naturally associate with the words action-packed and amazing stunts. Up next was ReCore, the robot ball-swapping third-person platforming job he unveiled last year, co-developed by Concept and Keiji Inafune. Hmm, perhaps the less said about him right now the better. Anyway, it was actual gameplay this time, something Microsoft certainly wasn't skimping on at this conference, that showed the main character, Jewel, running around with her robot dog, Mac, along with this big smashy robot from that reveal trailer last year that Jewel put the robot dog's ball into. Get your minds out of the gutter, said singular ball, not plural who's called Duncan for some reason, along with an all-new spider-looking robot with the name Seth, and hang on, wait, wait, wait a minute. The impression I got last year was one robot AI brain ball type what's it with interchangeable robot frames. Are you now telling me that they're actually three separate robots, each with their own different coloured ball? But if it's more than one ball, then how does Jill here carry them all? I'm confused. Anyhow, visually Recall's cast of characters look noticeably better and with more personality than the plastic dead-eyed golems of Mighty Number no. 9 did. Then again, Recall has big Microsoft money behind it and isn't solely being developed by Concept. Austin-based developer Armature Studio are co-developing it, so the lukewarm reaction to Mighty Number no. 9 shouldn't cast as large a shadow over it as it would if this was a Keiji Inafune-only project. Hajime Tabata and Matthew Kishimoto, representing Square Enix, were up next to present some exclusive gameplay of Final Fantasy XV. You can tell it's actually proper unscripted gameplay because, and I don't want to sound mean here, but they seemed a bit pants at it. Not terrible, not terrible, just average. Like when you're proficient enough with the basic controls, but it's the first time you fought a particular boss, so you're trying to get a feel for its attack patterns. Which is fine, we've all been there. Although, if they did somehow manage to script this bit, then consider me impressed. In a weird meta sort of way. Matthew and Hajime were specifically showing off a boss fight with this huge titan, along with a bunch of generic enemy soldiers that kept turning up, failing to dodge his massive stony arm swings and basically showing off the combat system. Gone for the most part are the menus of previous titles in favour of a more Kingdom Hearts-esque action RPG combat system, with revolutionary concepts like freedom of movement and parries which I quite like the look of, although Final Fantasy purists may very well disagree. They do like their menus after all. Still, as someone who stopped playing Final Fantasy after Final Fantasy VIII because Squall Leon Hart is a hateful little prick, there is something absurdly entertaining in watching a J-pop boy band beating up a giant stone man in real time. Before freezing his arm solid and shattering it with a well-placed shot. Speaking of shots in the arm, whether this turns out to be the one the series needs to come back stronger than ever, or a desperate last ditch attempt to stave off its gradual decline, will become clear when the game launches on September 30th. There is yet no PC version confirmed however, Windows 10 or otherwise, so let your liver enjoy a moment of respite. After that came a brief trailer for the Underground DLC for The Division, which will be coming before the survival one Ubisoft showed off during their conference. Now you see why I did the Ubisoft video first. It's so I didn't have to spend as long on this bit, obviously. Then Patrick Bach of DICE appeared on stage to pretty much deliver almost the exact same spiel he did during the EA conference, complete with No battle is ever the same. Although to his credit, that line only came out of his mouth once. He then showed the exact same trailer for Battlefield 1 that they showed at the EA conference. Apologies by the way if it seems like I'm zipping through this a bit too quickly, but fact of the matter is there was a lot of bloody stuff in this conference. I'm six pages into this script so far and I've barely scratched the surface of what Microsoft were flinging into our faces, so forgive me if I don't go into too much arse numbing detail in some segments. Like the bit where Mikey Barrow of Xbox Platform Engineering came on to talk about new Xbox Live stuff, like bringing more servers to more areas and cross-platform play. Microsoft's Siri-type thing, Cortana, is also coming to Xbox Live, meaning you'll soon be able to ask your Xbox One pressing questions like, why do I even need to have Cortana on this thing? 
On top of that, you'll also be able to take advantage of a new looking for group feature, similar to ones in MMOs like World of Warcraft, letting you find other people who might want to get the same achievements as you do, or something similar. Microsoft are also adding a feature called Arena, a new tournament platform that lets you set up unofficial tournaments with friends, or sign up for official ones even. Which was Microsoft's excuse to throw in a reference to EA Sports games like FIFA, one of the first games to utilise the new Arena feature. Like I even care. After that came the obligatory Minecraft segment, because Microsoft have decided you need an annual reminder that your children love Minecraft more than they love you. So Lydia Soulstealer Winters and Sax Person here of Mojang Jang were here to do just that, with what they call the Friendly Update, that adds cross-platform play between iOS, Android and Windows 10. Take a drink. As well as cross-platform play, the Friendly Update will also let you play in a friend's game world when they're not online, and vice versa. So if you're working on a grand epic construction project, your friends can help build it when you're busy with other things, like going to Cub Scouts or doing your chores. Your friends can also run amok, blowing up anything they see, erecting giant diamond cocks all over the landscape, and generally ruining everything you laboured for hours to build. Like demolishing that charming little woodland cottage you spent a whole weekend fretting over every tiny little detail of, setting fire to the rustic little village you painstakingly constructed around it over the following month, and utterly annihilating the hidden subterranean cathedral dedicated to the glory of Satan that you toiled over for untold heretical eons. Doesn't seem quite so friendly now, does it? Then suddenly, a wild John Carmack appeared, with a Gear VR strapped to his face and a burning desire to build a diabolical laboratory deep within the earth. He also came with some pre-scripted dialogue to read out. It feels like you're living and breathing in a Minecraft world. I've said that Minecraft was my grail for VR, and this was the most important gaming application that I could be involved with. The ability to spin around, take in everything, and have the freedom to explore an endless world is what I thought the core of VR was intended to be. So Lydia, what do you have to show me in your realm? That might sound a bit awkward and stilted to you, but please remember John Carmack only speaks English as a second language, his first one being machine code. There was also a plug for new texture packs, as well as a revolutionary new feature called add-ons that, according to Lydia Winters, Add-ons let players change mobs and animals into something completely new. Which, in the words of Sax Person, is It's just a first step towards a fully moddable future for Minecraft. Add-ons will come to Minecraft, Windows 10, iOS and Android and other mobile editions this fall. Because Minecraft has, of course, totally never ever been modded before. Yep, totally a figment of my fucking imagination right here. After a brief bit about custom Xbox One wireless controllers, it was time for the indie games, starting with a new trailer for Inside from Limbo developers Play Dead, before Chris Charla of ID at Xbox came on to shoot us all in the face with an absolute barrage of other indie titles both familiar and new. There was Cuphead, Outlast 2, Deliver Us the Moon, Fling Hook, Far, Slime Rancher, Shadow Tactics, Figment, The Culling, For the King, Beacon, Stardew Valley, Hand of Fate 2, Below, Raiders of the Broken Planet, Bloodstained, Ukulele and Everspace. Then some stuff about Ark, Survival Evolved, because it's on the Xbox Game Preview and had really good sales numbers. Apparently people who own the Xbox One version can, of course, play it for free on their Windows 10 PCs. Drink. The real shining jewel of this segment for me, however, was the gameplay demonstration of We Happy Few by Compulsion Games, a part procedurally generated first person not a walking simulator more than casually reminiscent of Bioshock, and set in a retro futuristic 1960s Britain, where everything has gone to hell in a beaded floral print handbag from Lady Jane's, and the majority of the population lives in a constant state of denial. No comment. I absolutely ruddy adore the look of this, and not just because I'm a massive fan of The Prisoner, one of the more obvious surreal British sci-fi influences We Happy Few proudly wears on its Carnaby Street velvet jacketed sleeve. There are also shades of A Clockwork Orange, Sapphire and Steel, Doctor Who, and even the Avengers. No, not those Avengers. I'm talking about these ones. That's Lady Elena Tyrell from Game of Thrones, by the way. Anyhow, consider me more than mildly intrigued and excited by this one. I love the visual style, I love the premise, and I also love that it isn't another YouTuber bait walking simulator. Not that there's anything wrong with those. I also really enjoyed Compulsion Games' last title, Contrast, even if it was rather short and ended somewhat abruptly. So I have some moderately high hopes for We Happy Few when it comes out on Early Access on July 26th, which also happens to be my birthday.
After that, we went straight into another game I'm more than mildly excited for, the standalone version of Gwent. Take my money. Presented by none other than the creator of player's favourite Witcher 3 side activity himself, CD Projekt Red's own Damien Monnier. Gwent is now a full-blown multiplayer experience with PC to Xbox One crossplay, no mention of Windows 10 mercifully, redesigned visuals and what Damien calls a monumental single-player campaign. The core mechanics remain the same, but CD Projekt Red have been tweaking the rules a bit. Stop your mum from fucking ferrets, Monier, and hands off our Gwent! I can't believe I only just got that reference. <clears throat> As I was saying, CD Projekt Red have been tweaking the rules, adding new abilities and beefing up regular non-hero cards for this standalone version. Hopefully such changes should mean the full game doesn't boil down to who has the most spy and hero cards like it did in Witcher 3. I'm also hoping it isn't pay to win either, like it is in Witcher 3. So I was a tad concerned to see the mention of in-game purchases on the website for the Gwent public beta, starting in September. Fans of the game's How Many Bastard Spies Do You Have faction, Nilfgaard, might be disheartened to see it's not included in the lineup of Northern Realms, Monsters, Scoia'tael and the new Skellige faction from The Witcher 3 Blood and Wine, but they needn't be. CD Projekt Red have since confirmed that Nilfgaard will be added to the game sometime after release. In the meantime, Nilfgaard players can… well, they can play with a bloody proper deck, can't they? Next up was Tekken 7, due out in early 2017 and presented by lead designer Katsuhiro Harada wearing a traditional Japanese Hakama. Because he's Katsuhiro Harada and that's just the sort of thing he does really. After that came Dead Rising 4, which has since confirmed to be an actual sequel and not a reboot as some people were suspecting. Which means that, yes, photojournalist Frank West here has only gotten himself trapped in the very same mall in the very same town in the very same state as he did in the first game during Christmas no less, which is also when Dead Rising 4 is due for release. This Christmas, that is, for Xbox One and Windows 10 as, thankfully, only a timed exclusive. So take another drink and look forward to a possible PS4 and Steam release. Shannon Loftus of Microsoft Studios Publishing popped up briefly to push the Play Anywhere initiative before being replaced by Hideki, your mum Kamiya, to show off some multiplayer gameplay for Scalebound and the biggest boss fight Platinum games have ever made. Which sadly looks a tad underwhelming at first. Less like the frantic combat one would expect from the creators of Bayonetta and more like a dull World of Warcraft raid boss. Things pick up a bit however when the main character gets off his dragon and actually gets his hands dirty and you can still easily tell this is what Platinum Games have been putting most of their effort into lately. It sure wasn't that Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game. We then got to Sea of Thieves, introduced with some pre-rendered cinematics, stage pyrotechnics and a sea shanty, before Craig Duncan of Rare popped on stage wearing a pretty awesome Goonies t-shirt. I mean what else would you wear to present a game about pirates? Besides the bleeding obvious of course. According to Craig, this was a world premiere of gameplay footage, taken when a bunch of people supposedly from the Sea of Thieves community were invited by Rare to play it without any tutorials beforehand and oh Christ, really Rare? Face cams? We don't need a corner of the screen taken up with someone who blatantly isn't an ordinary member of the community gurning for a camera. It's distracting and completely unnecessary because the gameplay clearly speaks for itself here. It's multi-crew ship combat like Guns of Icarus with non-combat socialising and exploration elements and looks genuinely fun as it is. We don't need to see emotional reactions from the cast of aspiring YouTubers the musical. That little bugbear aside, Sea of Thieves looks like something I'd love to play with a group of people. Except the PC version is, you guessed it, Windows 10 only. Drink. Then there was a trailer for State of Decay 2, sequel to State of Decay, followed by the melodramatic, albeit visually stylish trailer for Halo Wars 2, and Dan Ayub of 343 Industries coming on stage to talk about it. It's real-time strategy Halo, again, only they're working on it with Total War developers Creative Assembly so it might actually satisfy some of the PC RTS crowd this time, assuming they don't completely bugger up the AI or something. Oh, and do I really need to mention it's Windows 10 only? Take a drink. Finally, after all that, Phil Spencer reappeared in the exact same t-shirt he had at the start of the conference. This is all your fault. It wasn't quite the end of the conference however, no, because Phil still had one more thing to talk about. It took him a while to get there, but as he dropped phrases like A whole new gaming landscape, one being driven by an unprecedented pace of innovation and A world beyond generations, where people can play without boundaries. 
it became rather obvious rather quickly what this was leading up to. We believe in hardware innovation without sacrificing compatibility. Although I just want to say this line here sounded a tad more menacing than it was likely intended to be. The next step change for gamers and developers must deliver true 4K gaming and high fidelity VR. Or he'll start killing the hostages. Cue a gallery of Microsoft peeps and various developers, including Todd fucking Howard, talking about, well. This is the console that developers asked us to build. When I saw the specs of this thing, I'm like, wow. I got true to like, they're really going for it. We gave the SOC six teraflops of computing capability. To These are the highest quality pixels that anybody is seeing. Okay, enough bibble. It's Microsoft announcing their next console, codenamed Project Scorpio. Due out next year and dubbed the most powerful console ever. Until the next version comes along. Although they were quick to stress that they aren't leaving the original Xbox One behind. So that doesn't mean that we are leaving the original Xbox One behind. Yep. Welcome to the smartphone model applied to console hardware iteration, folks. Crikey, and I think it's only been three years since the Xbox One was launched. The Xbox Hank Scorpio will, according to Phil here, be all about 4K visuals and high fidelity VR. It will also apparently be compatible with the Xbox One and Xbox One S, with the same games playable across all three platforms. So why would anyone buy an Xbox One Slim when they can just wait a year and buy the most powerful console ever? Alas, Phil didn't have anything to say about that, except that they were announcing Scorpio now in order to give our developers and partners the ability to take advantage of that capability now. Yeah, Phil, like they didn't know already. How do you think we first heard rumours of the bloody thing? Anyhow, after that not too surprising reveal, the conference came to a close. Fuck me, was that a slog. Not a terrible, boring slog like the sports game segments of the EA conference, no. Merely a metric skip load of stuff to get through and process. I described the indie segment earlier as a barrage of games, but that also aptly sums up the entire conference. Lots and lots of stuff crammed into a very short space of time. Perhaps too much stuff. So much in fact, and not just games, that everything starts to kind of melt together into an indistinct, overwhelming slurry. I mean, all credit to Microsoft for packing their conference to the gills with stuff. It's nice to have plenty to chew on. I just found the sheer density of information almost overwhelming, to the point even memorable standouts like We Happy Few started getting lost in the haze. The whole Windows 10 thing was also not a huge selling point for me. Sure, I could upgrade, but then my video production process falls over and shits itself, so I then have to waste time getting it back up and running again, and that's something I frankly can't be asked to go through no matter how badly I might want to play Sea of Thieves. As for the Project Scorpio reveal, I'm currently in two minds about it. Releasing what is effectively a new console could leave Xbox One fans feeling like their console's been discarded after only four years. Then again, maintaining compatibility with the Xbox One does a fair bit to soften the blow. Frankly, until we know more about its specs, besides that silly six teraflops wibble, it's too early to say. With all that said, however, overall, this conference really wasn't anywhere near as bad as people were making it out to be. Certainly not what I'd personally call an awful one. Quantity can be said to have a certain quality all of its own, and Microsoft's conference at least had a damn sight more actual gameplay than the EA conference did. So in conclusion, Microsoft did okay. And with that, it's just two more conferences to go, so I'll see you beautiful misfits next time for my coverage of the Sony conference. I think. Let me check my list. Yep, definitely Sony, but wait, what the... Oh, for fuck's sake. Okay, so that bit in the Ubisoft video where I said it came before the Microsoft one, I actually meant to say that was the order I watched them in. Alright, then again, none of you actually called me out on that, so I probably could have gotten away with it, couldn't I? Yeah, I probably should have kept my big stupid fucking mouth shut about it and just... Oh god, I just want this all to be over. <sighs> I'm gonna go flog myself with a stick now. See you all next time for the Sony conference.
What are you doing? What are you doing, you horrid little min? She's horrid, she really is. Just comes in, ruins everything. She's gonna jump up here in a minute. Yep, told you. Fucking told you. She's gonna get behind the curtain there, she's gonna let sunlight in, ruining everything as she always does. Don't you, Mim? Lich dab! That was deliberate sabotage, wasn't it? You horrid little Mim. Why are you so horrid? Do you want to be in the video? Lady. You're gonna leave now. You're gonna go, go on. 